Hello, everyone. Welcome to EarthSafe Canada's uh, ongoing live speaker series online because of COVID. It allows us to bring in speakers from around the world, excuse me, as a matter of fact. Tonight, we're really pleased to have Dr. Gregory Tag with us speaking about veganism and evolution. Uh, Dr. K. Tag is a professor in the departments of literature, writing and publishing, and, inter and inter interdisciplinary studies, excuse me, and the founder and senior developer of the Evolutionary Studies Col Collaborative at St. Francis College in New York City. He is also the founder and organizer of a number of colloquia and multi multi multidisciplinary events. Uh, his latest book is The Vegan Evolution, Transforming Diets and Agriculture, which is coming later this spring. And he's other, another book that we were just discussing before we started this uh, live stream is a very good book, evidently, which I will read soon, called An Ape Ethic and the Question of Personhood. We're really pleased to have you with us, Dr. Tag. Uh, welcome. And everyone else watching, please put your questions in the uh, comments section on either Facebook or YouTube, and we will get to, we'll get to as many as we can in the question section after Dr. Tag's talk. Okay, uh, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Steele and EarthSafe Canada for having me, and uh, I'm glad that everyone is, is participating, so welcome. And I guess with that, uh, we can get started. That's the cover of the book that will be coming out. To have you with us, Dr. Tag. Uh, welcome. And everyone else. That's the cover of the book that will be coming out. To have you with us, Dr. Tag. The philosopher Lucy Schultz points out how traditionally nature has been set off in contrast to culture. There was a time when we were part of nature. Then, with the formation of cities, human culture separated from and eventually with industrialization invaded nature. One wonders if nature as perceived by the British romantic poets epitomized in William Wordsworth even exists any longer. At the same time, Schultz goes on, humans are biological animals derived from and evolved through nature. We've fabricated possessions from nature but not to every living creature's advantage. Western art and philosophy created a false idea of nature as wildlife, a landscape, another world. This flawed dichotomy, like the erroneous separation of mind and body promulgated by the 17th century philosopher Descartes, has enabled humans to justify their abuse of animals and ecosystems. In reality, now evident from the forceful onset of climate change, humans are dependent on and subject to, by their own excesses, the energies of nature. If not misinterpreting him, biologist Richard Alexander says that culture emerges from ontogeny. Culture is not unconnected to nature. Our primate genealogy is one of ancient kinship with the natural world and its ecology of food. The human relationship with nature can and must be restored through a culture of veganism. Certainly, harmony can evolve in groups, on the edges between groups, with new cultural combinations and copying. Eco-feminists, deforestation fighters, ethical vegans, black vegans, raw vegans, reducitarian dieters, climate activists, factory farm reformers, animal ethics advocates, nutrition educators, animal or environmentally friendly artists, whether in writing, music, or the visual arts, animal rights lawyers, animal or vegan studies scholars, etc., probably have more in common than not. The evolutionary case for veganism, which ties together a number of issues, could be a point of common ground where fringe groups make contact. On the perimeter, groups could engage in open debate to, to accommodate other viewpoints in an effort to cohere, address the opposition, 
and achieve real policy or cultural change. Cooperation is the answer to solving world health, hunger, and climate issues. We already have some collaboration, but require much more collective action. The aim is not to convince you to become a vegan, but to convince you that a vegan economy with vegan agriculture is a large part of the solution to our manifold global problems of worsening health and climate change. If I can do that, then maybe you will be the one to persuade someone else who is almost there to become vegan, creating a domino effect. And the presentation will cover these very large areas, biological theory, cultural evolution, great apes, early hominins, education, awareness, and influence, modern humans, and then there'll be a brief conclusion. Since we are products of biological evolution and require food to survive, basic principles of biology and physiology must be addressed followed by consideration of great apes and our hominin ancestors before striking into cultural evolution. Cultural evolution implies biology and why the dynamics of science factor into this debate about vegan culture. Genes respond to environment. And if the mutation is beneficial, it can be passed on and shared in a population as an advantageous adaptation. The evolution of forms and behaviors is not only biological. Beneficial alterations can occur culturally. Scientific theories make predictions to exclude the improbable. Science is about understanding patterns. In this vein, evolutionary theory is built on three pillars following Charles Darwin. Variation or mutation, competition or selection, and inheritance or retention. Biological evolution comes through the natural selection of the fitter, an individual with an enhanced ability to survive and reproduce by means of adaptation. Evolution is a change in gene frequencies, or as Darwin says, descent with modification. Invoking concepts from philosopher of biology, David Hull, Sociologist Marion Blute relates how evolution consists of variable replicators, genes, selected interactors, organisms, and evolving lineages, species. Natural selection is a shaping process correlating an organism's form and function. While environment exerts a powerful force on organisms, Selection is a regulating factor. For Darwin, adaptation follows from natural selection, enabling an organism to fit into its environment. Alternatively, an adaptation can be stabilized against mutations. The obvious question concerns how industrialized agriculture has evolved human health and behavior. Descendant traits are modified through an ancestral genome accentuated by chance or from necessity. An essential consideration for this discussion is in how the struggle for survival through variation impacts descendants. Approximately 90% of all life forms have gone extinct, suggesting that adaptations are temporary and not permanent solutions. The evolutionary case for veganism investigates not only how humans will adapt to their predominantly failing food ecology and worsening climate change, but also looks at the impacts artificially and naturally selected adaptations have on their progeny and organisms and ecosystems upon which humans depend. With the theory of natural selection, Darwin explains the inevitable mechanism by which species change over time in order to adapt when there is variation of individuals in a population. Descent with modification means differences 
have a genetic base so they can be passed on. Heritable diversity in a population is not only by genes, but can be values, beliefs, and practices. Some biologists tend to describe an organism's beneficial mutations for adaptation as enabling the individual or group, a population's genetic change over time to fit better into its environs. Ecological conditions, however, can change, which could lead to further adaptations for fitness enhancement and survival or not. The cultural ecology of food, therefore, is part and parcel of human evolution. There appears to be a cultural struggle for dominance or selection between the corporate agriculture of meat and a vegan ecology. At this point, consumers want to think about whether those two are compatible and how their conflict plays out in cultural evolution. The dangers and rewards are both high. Selection for thinkers like Peter Richardson and Robert Boyd is not paramount. Rather, they are more to population thinking, as is Joseph Henrik. Social learning and influence frequencies in this model count more than any focus on the innateness of inherited Stone Age mentality seen in evolutionary psychology. These authors, Richardson and Boyd, pointedly say that social learning is a strategic ingredient as humans adapted and continue to do so culturally. Population thinking and evolutionary psychology are not necessarily mutually exclusive since populations consist of anciently evolved brains and some innate archetypes and instincts. In other words, there's a coevolution of genes and culture. Is there shared belief via memes or true replication and retention via selection? Asks Tim Lewins, emphasizing cumulative population inheritance, cultural evolution may not need replicators. Alex Masudi might disagree as he leans more to selection theory. In the argument here, without eliminating selection, stress is placed on human culture and not human nature, depending on how one defines human, including which ancient and possibly extant ape species. What and how we learn is embedded in our long species history, evolutionarily on both the individual and group levels. There are cognitive mechanisms enabling learning from others and the environment. Hence, there's an intersection of biological and cultural evolution. The ideas considered concern the rise of cultural values and norms. For instance, along with the preponderance of meat and dairy, there's a definite interest in and flirtation with veganism. Adaptations not only affect current groups, but in consequence, if heritable, influence future generations. For some, the dominant food culture will remain centered on meat, while for others, it should gravitate to vegan ecology. Culture is information that alters behavior. A range of these theorists would suggest. What's key is that psychological inclinations and actual behaviors cannot spring from the dictates of laws, but must come from the influence of education under a combination of social effects on individuals and groups. Cultural traits are not really particulate matter like genes, but are ideas linked and interacting in a system somewhat like genes, which can replicate in various ways. Genetically, morphologically, and physiologically, and behaviorally, humans are similar to great apes. In fact, 
we are apes. Michael Wilson believes there are adaptive peaks. For gorillas, it's body size and guts for fermentation. For bonobos, it's the moist forest. For chimpanzees, it's foraging in broad areas with culture. For orangutans, it's an arboreal life feeding from fruit trees. Presumably, we are to accept that the adaptive peak for humans is in the farming of animals that is driving poor health and climate change? As Peter Andrews and RJ Johnson fear, we are developing physiological and psychological adaptations to eat highly processed supermarket foods. In the long run, that's not sustainable. In order to survive, all animals must eat and find new and better ways to harvest food, minerals, and water. Human behavior could be constrained by culture in how food preferences of a group can counteract resources in spite of availability. For example, a perceived need for meat over plentiful plant foods. For great apes, diet is correlated to habitat and the consequential structures of morphology, like dentition, and physiology, like digestion, and behaviors to survive and reproduce. A vegetarian or even vegan-like culture is part of our prehistoric roots and should once again be embraced. Chimpanzees can spend half the day eating with even more time allocated for food resourcing. There are about 180 types of vegetation covering 140 plant species. Commonly consumed are 155 or so plant types consisting of fruits, 50%, leaves, about 25%, buds, about 25%, supplemented by seeds, flowers, stalks, inner plant tissue, along with tree bark and resin. In all, about 230 different plant foods are eaten. Chimpanzees are known to self-medicate by eating plants that act like antibiotics, fight internal parasites, and work against malaria. Other great apes similarly medicate themselves. Insects, bird eggs, birds, and small mammals are also eaten on occasion. Soil is consumed for its mineral content. When available, fruits are the largest part of the chimp diet, while leaves are eaten often throughout the year, followed by seeds, and then insects like termites and caterpillars when available. Famed primatologist Jane Goodall conducted extensive field work research in the Gombe Stream area of Tanzania and says that chimpanzees, quote, crave variety in their diets with up to a dozen different foods on any given day. Covering two years of data observations of male and female chimpanzees, the vast majority of foods eaten, 65 to 95%, consist of fruits and leaves. Insects and meat range from less than 5% up to 20% any year, with some months near zero. Even so, on any given day, chimps might eat insects, but certainly not prized meat. Insect and meat eating vary widely month to month, and these percentages gathered across 1978 to 1979 are only approximations. While Goodall admits that meat consumption is not unusual, a table she provides indicates that from 1960 to 1981, there were only 221 red colobus monkeys eaten at Gombe. That would be less than one monkey consumed for any group during a time span of over 20 years. Worth noting is that a chimp group could consist of over, but often less than 100 individuals. On average, an adult colobus weighs up to 20 pounds, where the chimpanzees would typically hunt juveniles. Gisela Kaplan and Leslie Rogers note that in another 10-year study, 
chimpanzees at Gombe killed and ate nearly 400 colobus monkeys, fewer than one per day, multiplied by any number of individuals in a group across the community, depending on what was shared with whom. David Watts and John Matani, more recently, indicate that this hunting in Kabali National Park, Uganda, has increased over time since the red colobus is easy prey. Between 1995 and 2014, 912 colobus monkeys were target kills. Importantly, Watts and Matani point out that chimpanzees are not obligate carnivores, like big cats. If the monkeys are available and easy prey, since they share a similar habitat, the encounter is advantageous for the chimp. It's important to stress that the meat eating carries a vital social function to maintain status, develop alliances, and gain sexual favors. Organisms require food to survive, but evident in the meat eating of some chimps in certain locations at various times, foodstuffs can be cultural. Shirley Strum observed olive baboons not far from Goodall's Tanzania and noticed changes in a troop based on the hunting skill of an individual who eventually enabled other males to help or copy him. Strum noted 100 kills in 1973 of baby gazelles, 10 times the amount of monkey kills by chimps at Gombe. This hunting was not universal baboon behavior, Strum says, since baboons are not true carnivores. The hunting over scavenging seems cultural, evident in how it tapered off among these baboons to very little in time. Hunting and meat eating, past and present, are human behaviors shared with some primates, though in wild populations of chimps, meat consumption varies because of a number of factors, including differing cultural practices. Vicky Oles and others used hair isotope data over seven months for two groups of Western chimpanzees and found variations of meat consumption due to micro habitats, sex, and social groups. Mainly as folivores, gorillas fuse around one male with several females in leaf rich locations and feed among about 230 different plant foods. Among lowland gorillas, those in the highest eastern areas can show dietary similarity to mountain gorillas. Eastern lowland gorillas with small and scattered populations who range in nether regions feed more on fruits and insects. Gorillas seem to range more widely than chimpanzees, utilizing a variety of vegetation to feed and nest. In the lowlands, there's much fruiting food overlap for gorillas and chimpanzees. But chimps consume more parts of a plant absent fruit in the higher elevations. Elevation, sorry. For gorillas, some areas have a greater number of foods than others. For example, the Virunga Montane has approximately 80 foods with about 40 plant species, whereas the Lope Reserve has about 210 foods with about 160 plant species. This differential range demonstrates gorilla dietary flexibility. A study shows that in 256 fecal sample analyses of 54 gorillas and 394 fecal sample analyses of 22 chimpanzees, there was less than 1% insect remains for the gorillas to 30% for the chimps, with 2% showing mammal remains for the chimpanzees. Thus, their foods differed dramatically in spite of their genetic and habitat similarities. Chimpanzees can eat some meat, but much depends on the community, location, 
and other factors. Orangutans, notes renowned primatologist Berute Galvikas, rely on a multifaceted compound diet of fruits, nuts, leaves, bark, sap, shoots, stems, honey, fungi, and other such foods, including insects. Orangutans closely inspect and eat up to about 400 different foods, mostly plants. Gazella Kaplan and Leslie Rogers indicate that because of their need to travel and recall fruit locations, orangutans have excellent spatial and temporal awareness. Likewise, Ann Russen says that orangutans demonstrate a high degree of intelligence and in how they identify, handle, and manipulate foods for sustenance. One reason why she dubs them as, quote, wizards of the forest. Their staple nourishment comes from wild, ripe fruit like durians, mangosteens, mangoes, meringue, balai, jackfruit, snake fruit, ramatans, and, ban and banatan nuts. There could be nearly two dozen fruiting trees and vines monitored each ripening at different times of the year across various locations of the Asian forest. Though rare, orangutans have been seen to eat small mammals, but this could be driven by food stress or the physical requirements placed on a lactating female. Ranging is important in terms of sourcing preferred fruits high in carbohydrates and protein. Though orangutans will eat bitter fruit less nutritional figs that are abundant in many species and leaves. A fallback famine food is a tree's exterior covering. Depending on the geographic location and time of year, the diet for large captive primates is primarily a mix of fresh vegetables, fruits, nuts, etc ranging from onions, tomatoes, carrots, potatoes, sweet potatoes, peppers, broccoli, celery, cauliflower, avocado, cassava, eggplant, maize, green beans, potato greens, corn, legumes, cabbage, yams, rabbitan, cucumber, watermelon, jackfruit, pawpaw, assorted melons, lemons, limes, assorted berries, mangoes, apples, oranges, grapefruit, pomelo, grapes, Pears, pineapple, avocados, bananas, rice, peanuts, peanut butter, sunflower seeds, assorted unsalted nuts, pasho, millet or soya flour, and other various beans. There's often an abundance of leafy greens like kale, collards, dandelion, chicory, spinach, and different kinds of lettuce. One North American sanctuary says that it leans more to the leafy greens than commercially produced fruit out of concern for sugar content. Vitamin and mineral supplements might be administered separately or through fortified measured primate chow. If the chow is not vegan certified, the calcium it contains is possibly from dairy and it might include taurine from animal bile. Omega-3 and linoleic acids can be found in flaxseed or corn oils, which are used in cooking, if there is any. Brianna Pobner indicates that meat and fat would not have dominated hominin diets before 2 million years ago, but for passive or marginal scavenging. Recall that some apes, especially gorillas, rarely, if ever, eat meat and yet they are the strongest of ape people. The key idea to hold is that Homo sapiens evolved from a common ancestor to a chimpanzee and like other related species has a shaggy family tree whose frayed distortions defy any straight linearity of descent. The many allied hominin species who predate us and prepare for our entry were not obligate meat eaters. In no way did they preserve the scale of highly processed and chemically contaminated beet and dairy products eaten today. We have somehow maladapted ourselves to processed supermarket foods. We can return to a plant-based diet and one could argue that from necessity, we should adapt a vegan economy of local farming communities, manufacturing and distributing veggie foods. 
W.P.T. James and others affirm how ecological factors like a cooling environment of around two to three million years ago altered the human diet with a shift to some species toward occasional animal protein, fats, and minerals. In a similar way, by about eight million years ago, cooling temperatures killed many European apes while some retreated back to Africa, which had forest and fruits. James suggests these natural foraging changes, along with bipedalism and cooperative behavior to avoid predators in the savanna, account for increased social behavior and brain expansion. Note, however, there are brain gene transcription differences between chimpanzees and humans that could have arisen from other factors of evolution. Human populations migrated fiercely and evolved various adaptations to differing climates and food sources. Bipedalism capacities are apparent in an environment that was cooling and drying with expanding vegetal grasslands and shrinking tree forests. Food scarcity would have forced exploitation of new resources for survival. Early hominins like Australopiths had shorter arms and longer legs with a big toe like a modern human. Occasional bipedalism increased the ability to range for ripe fruit as opposed to a smaller range by an omnivore like a baboon. Bipedalism is energy efficient, increases time budgets and permits carrying. Many ape species went extinct unless they adapted to these changes by ground dwelling. The bipedal survivors in grasslands would be Australopiths from about 4.4 to 1.2 million years ago and later Homo habilis from about 2.5 million years ago. Robin Dunbar goes as far as calling Homo habilis a late transitional Australopith. Much of Africa was tropical forest well before 4 million years ago. After that, our ancestral relatives spent less time in trees as foot morphology shows. After bipedalism, from a number of pressures, including adaptation to heat, evident prominently in the Homo ergaster, who has an external nose, dentition changed. By 4.2 million years ago, hominins had already developed, compared to chimps, larger, flatter sheep teeth and smaller canines, even in males. Enamel thickened. These evolved adaptations were for grinding and crushing foods like nuts, seeds, and fibrous material found close to the ground, as opposed to nutrients in trees. This is not to say early hominins simply walked out of the forest. Rather, retained ape-like tendencies were adaptations for feeding, nesting, and protection in trees. From about 4.5 to 2.3 million years ago, covering Autopithecus, with conservative molars geared for frugivory, to Australopithecus africanus, about 3 million years ago, with molars more specialized for tough foods, say Mark Tiford and Peter Unger. Hominin dietary competencies in teeth size and enamel evolved in response to climate and available resources. Phytolith or mineral plant particle analyses of Australopithecus sediba reveal a diet from both grasslands, similar to that of savanna chimps, and forests, including fruit, leaves, and bark. Looking past the early hominins, Let's say a few words about our more recent direct ancestors who factor into the bigger picture. Homo habilis, about 2.5 million years ago, had a, a larger cranial area and smaller cheek teeth than Australopithecus and Paranthropus, though there was variation in the evolutionary matrix with some specimens having teeth like Australopithecus. Later, 
Homo erectus, about 1.8 million years ago, had smaller teeth and a larger cranial capacity. The early hominin australopiths were followed by Homo erectus, who thrived for a very long time as a chrono species, namely from Homo ergaster and other relations in Africa to a larger brained, brained Homo erectus in Eurasia. Then, by about 500,000 years ago, from the Ergaster erectus sphere, with some species on the margins, there is Homo heidelbergensis with a much larger brain and more culture. Homo erectus lived until as late as 60,000 years ago, and in one form 12,000 years ago as Homo florensiensis on Indonesian islands. So a very successful species. We have not yet lived as long. From these archaic humans, Neanderthals arise in Europe during the Ice Age. Far in the deep south of Africa, another archaic human evolved as Homo sapiens, our species, with a larger brain and a more gracile body. In lower Paleolithic people like Neanderthals, and their predecessors, Homo heidelbergensis and Homo erectus, about 2 million years ago to 250,000 years ago, there would have been seasonal ecological and social strategies for food gathering and processing. Theirs was a generalized diet, says Robert Hosfield, open to continuing debate about levels of plant versus animal foods. He, Hosfield notes, for instance, that Neanderthals ate seeds and leafy plants and not only meat, eggs, or marine foods to supply essential fatty acids. Energy was needed to capture spotty prey. Most lower Paleolithic areas occupied were temperate woods, offering abundant plant foods. So meat was not necessarily a daily experience, says Hosfield. Some researchers found Amelie's enzyme residue on Neanderthal teeth indicating a boost in sugars from starchy foods and hence a diet dependent on plants. The typical viewpoint, however, is that Neanderthal, the Neanderthal diet was heavily geared toward red meat, though raw and cooked vegetables were readily consumed based on dental analysis. Regardless, there would have been food sharing networks. One interesting note from Hosfield is how Neanderthals might have eaten rotten meat stored underground or in water as an alternative to cooking. This practice of preservation and preparatory digestion, although offensive to most modern humans, demonstrates how there is a cultural ecology of food that can change. Similarly, with scarcity of seasonal plant food in colder climates, these people, Hosfeld notes, engaged in gastrophagy or the eating of partially digested remains in an animal's stomach. In some hunter-gatherer cultures, this method of eating pre-digested food is still practiced. This procedure would be unacceptable to some societies today bolstering my point about the cultural ecology of food. Energy and time are required to find and prepare meats, as in cooking. Instead, pounding of plant foods would have been more easily employed. Nutrition flexibility, even among plant foods, would have been essential to Neanderthals, though in many locales, depending dependency was on the meat of ungulates. Diet is related to many behaviors, including society and migration. Like modern humans, weaning for Neanderthal infants began at five to six months, say Alessa Nava and others, based on isotope technology of deciduous teeth. Good nutrition was required for the establishment of tooth enamel, some herbivore environments of Neanderthals no longer exist, and they were surely good hunters and not simply scavengers. 
Neanderthals generally were not specialized to a particular environs or taxa, says Robert Power, but lived on a substance strategy of the best foods, counting many plants, but still animals. Isotope and other analyses, Power goes on, reveal how high protein food like meat present at best, presented at best a generalized picture of the cultural ecology of food for Neanderthals. Correspondingly, Hosfield says that recent research using isotopic and dental analyses reveals less reliance on protein-rich animal diets among Neanderthals, especially in comparison to current hunter-gatherers. These conclusions vary contingent on the time of year, geographical location, and mobility. Yet evidence reveals, power stresses, that Neanderthals ate nuts, seeds, olives, roots, berries, lentils, peas, vetchling, grass, husks, legumes, fruit, etc. Depending on plant concentrations in warmer areas, there was processing, but apparently there is confirmation of abundant plant use even during cold periods. Because of living in higher latitudes with a cold climate, Neanderthals collected meat from animals as a major food source. There's no doubt, however, however, say Christopher Stringer and Clive Gamble, that there were copious amounts of plants readily consumed too. For example, these authors note, in Germany around 200,000 years ago, there were temperate zones and warm springs near Weimar that encouraged a flourishing of abundant flora. Neanderthals had no real home camps until about 60,000 years ago with, for instance, stone hearths, post holes for coverings, pit, pits, trenches, etc. This lack of a basic site suggests regular movement or no real importance assigned to any particular butchering, cooking, or stone napping plot. Stringer and Gamble are skeptical of regular specialized big game hunting by Neanderthals that is still promulgated. It seems that small animals were preferred. They also note that scavenging as well as hunting is not irregular behavior, but involves planning in terms of knowing where to go at which time and involved stone technology. Rather than focusing on bones at the end of those sites, which could have been hunted, scavenged, or left by big cats or hyenas, it's more productive to consider all the elements of various Neanderthal regions with subsistence security based on resource strategies dependent on the flora and fauna of any province. For instance, Laura Weyrich and others show that DNA evidence culled from a cave in Belgium or a cavern in Spain and a grotto in Italy disclose there's no surprise that generally Neanderthals varied their diets based on regional ecology. These samples reveal lots of meat eating, and although not pumped up with antibiotics or hormones, this was not an ideal diet. However, from a cave in Spain, there is no evidence of meat eating, and instead, mostly mushrooms, pine nuts, moss, and forest gatherings. Microware analyses from other ecological areas, say Weyrich, indicate diets centered on what was available, like plants. As noted above in terms of great apes and australopiths, sustainable diets were based on variety, not on meat alone. Since meat and dairy were not exclusive foods for our hominin ancestors, we don't need to consider corporate agriculture, pro agriculture products as sustainable food ecology today. Circling back, all told, the data show is that anatomically modern humans are not born hunters and eaters of meat. As revealed, our Australopith prehistory is not one of excessive consumption, and there was little meat eating, if any, in some species. Similarly, later in the hominin evolutionary line, Zink and Lieberman insist that with smaller teeth, bite force, and chewing time, decreased advantageously in Homo erectus by using stones to smash tubers and mechanically process small portions of meat before the advent of cooking. 
Bonnie Yoshida Levine bluntly states that Homo erectus was not just a meat eater. Animal ethics taught in a classroom could have implications in the real world. This proposition was addressed by Eric Schweitzgebel, Bradford Cocklett, and Peter Singer. These authors say that young people can experience behavioral change and overcome ethical dissonance toward animals. The US study was based on a single class meeting of four very large groups and their attitudes about eating meat. Half the students read about animal farming, watched a video, and engaged in a discussion about animal ethics. The control group of half worked more broadly on the notion of charity. Then the researchers examined for the entire semester meal card purchases totaling well over 10,000 receipts for about 500 students. The prediction was that the animal ethics class and discussion would have no effect. However, the results indicate that for those students who discussed the, more, the moral complexities of farming and eating animals, meal purchases for meat declined by 7% and remained stable for weeks. There was no change in meat eating in the group that discussed charitable giving. The researchers consider any drop in meat purchasing sustained over even a short time from one class meeting quite significant. There were variables. The authors say that in such large groups, there was probably social or emotional influence where experiences of those who already ate less meat demonstrated how normal that behavior really is. In line with my argument, the authors go on to say that logos-based rational claims might have exerted important guidance in any student's ethical decision to eat less meat. Young people need options, not dictates. Juvenile primates like gorillas and Japanese macaques, say, says George Schaller, appear more receptive to new foods in contrast to adults. A positive outlook is to offer a vegan ethos so indiv individuals, young and old, can decide on and adapt to the diet that fits their conscience. Uh, this paper, the one I alluded to by Schwitzgebel, supports claims about the importance of informing young people and more broadly any given community about the reasonable claims of avoiding meat and dairy products for personal and environmental health, to say nothing of the implication concerning animal ethics. Outside of the classroom, we need to get and then hold the attention of young people to these issues. The lesson of making moral choices from brief instruction should be kept in mind. The evolutionary case for veganism is about shifts in cultural attitudes, values, and beliefs that are advantageous to humans, ecosystems, and animals. Educators and community leaders need to be more forthcoming in sensitizing people about the overall benefits of a vegan culture. If food is culture, and if moral norms inhere in culture, then there is an ethic about food and eating. Cultural leaders have an obligation to teach a food ethos that centers on the health of a person in a larger ecological environment. The authors of the Classroom Ethics Report confirmed their findings in a follow-up empirical study attesting how education can be a powerful influencer on the unidirectional behavior of young people in terms of making positive changes to their health, the global climate, or animal lives. Cultural context could heighten or lessen the effects of such educational influence. Other scholars, too, conclude that meat eaters dissociate their empathic and disgust emotions from the reality of what's put in their mouths. This dissonance occurs in how the meat is presented. For example, a dismembered and headless corpse elicits less revulsion or the language used, for example, free range rather than slaughtered or beef rather than cow. Such stilted attitudes against living creatures arise from culture 
and education. This disconnection of basic sympathy for animals yet killing them for food is a meat animal paradox. The appetite for meat stems from categorizing animals as food without moral standing, as objects without feelings, and as inanimate things that don't suffer. Those distorted perceptions are cultural values, but could be altered through educational awareness. Researches also show that we are not purely objective thinkers. Instead, our beliefs can determine how we see the world. Specifically, studies indicate that teaching faulty ideas regarding how an animal is raised, like the happy farm critter from children's books, determine effective responses to the meat on one's plate. Isabel Renaxi talks about an ecological worldview that is often narrow since it matches one's own interests. In contrast, one should become more broadly aware, eco-literate, and in touch with personal feelings as they connect to others. Seeing the world as set one way is not sustainable. Emotional intelligence also factors into a sustainability mindset. One needs to question socially accepted values such as achieving wealth and material status over conservation. Here, the author suggests not becoming unreactive and resigned to fate, rather innovation and adaptability and reflective consciousness are crucial. Finally, there's what uh, the author calls a spiritual intelligence in opposition to what's simply utilitarian or rational. Sustainability and sustainable thinking should veer away from possessive consumption and self-centeredness to an intuitive oneness with nature to nurture compassion and empathy. What's notable is how symbiotic mentality is precisely on point with my message. Ecological food changes need not come solely from technology. Attention should shift to moral attitudes emerging from education, not just in history and science, but in philosophy, and particularly the arts to transform individuals fundamentally by breaking tightly held conservative preconceptions about health, the environment, and animals to embrace a more liberal world vision. Most vegans were raised as meat-eating omnivores and successfully adapted their awareness to a more sustainable way of thinking. Others can too. By the same token, Zoe Wilde argues that we need to educate from an early age what she calls solutionary persons, not competitors, or those who work humanely and sustainably to root out and correct exploitive systems like animal farming. How one lives ethically is not just about a community of people, but also related to the ecology of food, celebrating without harming the diversity of animal life. While skills in education are important, how one lives her life as a moral individual is paramount. We are not fully educating children to be friends of the natural world, animals, ecosystems, and less advantageous people. Cultural group competition and selection affect cooperation. And since selection works on variation, Cooperative behaviors like cooperative behaviors likely stem from clashes between cultural groups. This observation does not mean that we will always have vegans versus meat and dairy eaters and nothing more. What's proposed is the opposite, since a capacity for cooperation can conceivably arise between competing groups through hybridized seeds of cultural group selection. Innovation increases the adaptive fitness of a population. Some see an opportunity to invent. Outside groups then embrace the adaptive innovation. We compete culturally, but that's where cooperative change can begin. Some social networks like communities of vegans can break maladaptive conformity like meat and dairy eating to construct a better outcome among differing groups who are willing to accept the improved change in food ecology. Instruction of young people is the linchpin in any vision of a vegan culture. One study reveals that children are more geared to saving many pigs over a human life 
than any adult is inclined. The goal of humanity should not be to desensitize children to other life forms. We tend to be influenced to learn from those who share our beliefs. Of course, because of partisan politics in some countries, there are worries about who shapes the beliefs of children according to whose values. Adults, nonetheless, should not be under some obligation to inculcate children to prioritize their self-serving special humanity over all other life forms. As we can see from many recent events, whether deforestation, habitat loss, environmental catastrophes, or pandemics, that is very, a very costly proposition. The man as hunter concept originated in the early 20th century with Raymond Dart, who interpreted some finds of Australopiths in South Africa sites as bloodthirsty carnivores. Unfortunately, this inaccurate, culturally accepted perspective persisted into the later decades of the 20th century and even in the current popular imagination. This invalid conception of meat as the centerpiece of a human diet, especially for Australopithecines, is evident in contemporary writing, apparent in an article from the popular magazine National Geographic that actually seems to credit Dart's judgment in order to endorse a meaty paleo diet. Ecology is a milieu of many organisms competing with each other and yet simultaneously working in mutual assistance as biological and even cultural phenomena. Man the hunter paints a rather simplistic picture of what's outlined in my chapter covering Australopithecus. And finally, a cultural shift away from meat and dairy eating, focusing on local sustainable farming across municipalities, utilizing suburban permaculture farms, abandoned urban buildings, and malls with green energy kitchen facilities making veggie products could shift the environmental calculation back to our favor. Part of the social change would include attitude adjustments about vegan culture. Another part would rely on refabricating existing food infrastructure to accommodate energy efficient small farms like rooftop and school gardens or vertical plantations, including indoor farms and regional distributors of minimally, minimally processed vegan food products. If you own a small lamb kebab shop, you could easily prepare and promote healthy vegan foods. Thank you very much for listening. There, it took me a second to get unmuted there. The button wasn't behaving So Thank you very much, uh, Greg. That was an excellent talk. Very, very informative. We pretty much used up our hour, but I think we can probably get a couple of questions in. One's a very practical one. One person asked, can we make a transcript available of your talk? Would it be at all possible for you to provide a transcript of it? Um, well, uh, let me think about that because the book hasn't yet been published and I sure. probably have to talk to the publisher. Okay. Um, that's fine. But, I, I replied by message that it probably wouldn't be, but in any case, I thought I'd ask you. And we'll have time for one more. Uh, this is actually quite a good one. How will the cultural change happen? Are there stages of change? If so, where are we on this path? And what are the most important things to focus on now? Oh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, uh, well, cultural change could happen very quickly. We see that in fads and things like that. Um, cultural acceptance of certain kinds of music and other things. So it could happen and it is happening. It seems more and more people are moving to some type of plant-based diet, whether for health reasons or environmental reasons or animal ethic, ethics reasons. So it's happening right in front of us. And I think that because of the corporate agricultural mentality and they wanna jump on the bandwagon and make money off of this, it's probably going to happen and it is happening sooner than we think. I mean, we live in Brooklyn, New York, and we can go in almost any supermarket and we're amazed at how many vegan products there are now, opposed to maybe 10, 15 years ago. Yes, so very it's very similar to Vancouver, I agree. Yes. Go ahead, continue, sorry. I, was I just... mean, I, that, that's a great question. And that gets to the whole point I'm trying to make. So 
you know, and it depends on um, how we want to raise children. I'm not saying that we have to indoctrinate them, but, you know, give them choices, let them know where their food comes from. When I was a kid growing up in Brooklyn, we ate this thing called tongue. And then I was horrified later in life because there were four kids and we didn't have a lot of money. I was horrified later in life when I went to a supermarket and I saw a cow's tongue. That's what I ate. Or we had liver and onions. And it's like, oh, we're eating liver and onions. What's that? And then later I realized it's a, it's a, an organ, you know, like mine. It's like, no, I don't want to eat that. That's a good answer. Thank you. Uh, we're actually out of time, Gregory, but it was thank you very, very much. We really appreciate it. And I'll talk with you after the talk. Okay, thank you, thank very, you much. very much for having me, Dr. Steele, and Earth Safe Canada. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.